Hello, everybody. And uh, welcome back to this uh, Oceanics webinar series. Uh, today, we are extremely happy to welcome uh, Nicolas Corti, who is professor at uh, Université de Bretagne Sud. Nicolas uh, is going to talk to us today about uh, optimal transports for transport for graphs. So as usual, the presentation will be uh, will take around uh, 45 minutes and we'll have some time uh, for questions and discussions after. So thanks again, Nicola, for accepting uh, to give this presentation today and I'm, and I'm happy to uh, give you the floor to start your presentation. Thank you again. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Said, for the uh, introduction and thanks a lot for inviting me to, uh, to present my work um, during this, uh, this uh, webinar. So actually, uh, as you said, I'm one of the leader of the, I mean, the leader of the Obelix group in uh, in Van, so very close to uh, to Brest, and uh, we are doing some work at the uh, crossroad between uh, machine learning and uh, remote sensing. And uh, actually, I'm also uh, one of the recipient of the of one ANR chair, which is called Autopia, which is um, linked to the applications of optimal transport in uh, in remote sensing. Uh, uh, learning, uh, learning task and uh, applications, but uh, I will not be speaking a lot about uh, remote sensing. And uh, uh, as I've seen on the on the website, um, maybe my talk will not be that much focused on weather forecast or the dynamic systems, or maybe uh, uh, it will not be very aligned with the history of talks that you have uh, had in uh, in uh, in this uh, webinar series. But um, I'll be talking on uh, on a uh, subject that, that might uh, interest you, maybe with respect to some aspects, because I, I, I'll be dealing with uh, learning on graphs. And uh, it's not clear to me uh, whether right now there are a lot of uh, connections between uh, uh, data assimilation and, uh, and graph uh, theory and learning on graph. But maybe maybe this talk will, uh, will open some, uh, some uh, discussions on this, uh, on this specific topic. So um, clearly, the, the, this work is not uh, a product of uh, myself uh, alone. So it's uh, a result of several co collaborations with a lot of uh, very nice uh, collaborators. Uh, Rémi Flammary, Titan Vallier, Laetitia Chapelle, Romain Tavenard, Yevgen Redko, Cédric Vincent Cuaz, and uh, Marco Corneli. Uh, and uh, so I, I should give uh, credit to, uh, to mostly to, to them for, for this presentation. Okay, so um, in short, uh, I will be discussing about uh, a very uh, generic um, machine learning uh, context where we need to make some decision uh, with respect to, uh, to data. And uh, usually when it comes to machine learning, you can ask yourself uh, two questions. One first question is how to represent the data, what are the, the data and how to operate on them. So uh, in, as a maybe, uh, a way to tackle the data, we choose a mathematical representation, which is uh, a, pr a probabilistic representation of the data. So by uh, assuming that we have data, we'll be assuming that we deal with uh, probability distributions. And those probability may be either continuous, if we have an infinite number of, uh, of samples or parametric uh, densities, or maybe uh, discrete, if we have just collections of, uh, of samples. And how to operate on them, then we will rely, and I will discuss maybe a little bit more about this, we will rely on the optimal transport theory. So optimal transport is a, I mean, a recent subject of interest in the machine learning community since the, the work from, uh, from Couturier in 2012. And um, actually, uh, we are not going to use the classical way to use the optimal transport we are going to uh, look at a different challenge where uh, the data are not samples in a classical Euclidean space, but rather they are, um, we, are yeah, we will call them the structured data. Structured data means that you have some specific relations among, uh, among the data themselves. And uh, usually they can live also in heterogeneous spaces. Heterogeneous spaces mean that the data uh, might not live into compar directly comparable spaces. So wh wh what I mean by this is that, okay, if we have just like samples in R2 and samples in R3, we cannot just measure some uh, distances or uh, 
uh, we cannot just measure directly how close are to data. So we will mostly focus uh, uh, on our talk on this particularly uh, challenging settings where uh, we deal with structured data and that are not directly uh, comparable. And so we will try to, to see how we can bend the optimal transfer theory to, to deal with those kinds of data. And uh, um, maybe we uh, will try to show some uh, applications of, uh, of this uh, uh, theoretical setting in the context uh, of, uh, of specifically of graph and uh, learning uh, over uh, over graph, uh, graph data. So my talk will, will be divided in four parts. And uh, as usual, I'm, I'm, I've been, I mean, I've, I've been very uh, generous on the, on the number of slides. So uh, I, I guess that maybe I will not be able to, uh, to touch the fourth part if I want to, uh, to stay in the 45 minutes uh, length. But uh, le 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 let's see how, we, uh, how it goes. And so I, I'll, I'll try to, uh, maybe for those of you that are not familiar with optimal transport, and uh, I will try to, to make a, uh, like a concise uh, introduction to, to this. And then I will talk about two work that we presented in ICML 2019, 2019 and uh, 2021 that are related to uh, using um, optimal transport for graph data. And if I have the time, I will talk about uh, a new uh, version of uh, gromos wasserstein uh, distance that, we, that will appear in uh, ICLR uh, this, uh, this year. So feel free to uh, interrupt me. Feel free to, uh, to ask questions whenever you, uh, you have some. And let's, let, let's make this talk mostly uh, informal so that we can uh, exchange uh, things and, and ideas, right? Okay. So let's go with uh, optimal transport. So the, the, in the classical optimal tra transport uh, framework, generally uh, we consider two uh, probability distributions that uh, are, will be denoted mu and nu in the, in the reminder and that will, uh, okay, we'll try to, to, to keep with the uh, red and blue uh, uh, color scheme so that we can always uh, recall uh, what, what, what we are talking about. So, so we have two um, probability distributions and the goal of optimal transport is to define the kind of uh, geometric notion of distance between those, uh, those distributions. And uh, this notion of distance means that we will be able to, to compare two uh, uh, distributions, but we will also, and it's a byproduct of optimal transport, we will also find uh, meaningful correspondences and uh, relations between uh, the samples that are um, uh, related to those uh, to those distributions. So, um, I mean, why should we care about uh, about this? I mean, measuring a, a kind of a dissimilarity or a kind of similarity between probability distributions is at the core of uh, most of the machine learning tasks. And uh, usually, um, okay, if we talk with the links between probability distribution and data. Okay, let's assume that if we have a collection of data xi in a space rd, then uh, those data, they define actually a probability distribution, which is an empirical probability distribution, which means that uh, it, it can be represented as a sum of weighted uh, Dirac's, uh, and those Dirac's would be located on, uh, on uh, xi. And uh, associated to those Dirac's, that would be um, a weight and uh, if we have a collection of data, generally, we do not assume any priority between the data. And generally, those weights, they should be uniform. So we have a kind of uniform uh, probability distribution, uh, which are located on all the samples uh, lo lo locations. But usually, you can also think, when you think about probability distribution, you can think about histograms. And in this case, I mean, the, the xi, uh, they are just location uh, onto a uniformly discretized grid in the space. And then the weights are just uh, maybe uh, densities at those locations X, uh, Xi. And I will refer to, in this case to uh, uh, the notion of Eulerian probability uh, distribution opposed to the Lagrangian one where we, are, we deal with particles. And when we deal with histograms, we, we, we deal with discretization of the space. 
And in all those cases, the vector of uh, weight, the vector A, belongs to uh, the probability simplex, meaning that we sum to uh, we sum to one. Okay. Then okay. Then the optimal transport problem requires uh, another ingredient, which is, uh, and this is why it is a geometric notion of distance. It requires a cost function. This cost function takes two elements from the space X and Y and gives a generally positive, but it's not mandatory, give a, a notion of how, how distant uh, X and Y are, are carried out. And um, we call it, uh, I mean, we, we, we talk about optimal transport because there is a, a transportation in meaning that we transport the mass from mu to uh, mu through uh, a, a given joint law, which I, I will call uh, pi in, in the in the next uh, in the next uh, uh, slides. And uh, this um, transport would be optimal because it will minimize the overall cost of moving all the mass of all the probability mass from mu to uh, uh, to uh, to mu and uh, so let me give you a, a very simple uh, classical example in this case uh, we have some bakeries that produce uh, uh, a certain quantity of bread so those bakeries they are located at locations uh, uh, xi and uh, they are represented as uh, red dots so you can Think of the, the, the weight AI as a kind of quantity of breads pro produced by one bakery. And then there is a demand of breads in the cafe that are uh, in locations uh, YG. And uh, they need a specific, uh, they have also a specific de demand, which is BG. And uh, the distance in this case would be um, the distance from uh, any bakery to any, uh, any cafe. And uh, the goal of optimal transport would be to route all the breads from the bakeries to the cafe in the cheapest way, meaning that we want to, uh, to travel the minimal distance between uh, them to, uh, uh, to take all the breads uh, from the bakeries to all uh, the cafes. And uh, how can we cast this problem? So this is the work from Leonid Kantorovich at the middle of the 20th century uh, and he got the Nobel uh, economic Nobel Prize for, for this we can cast this problem in this way so we are looking for uh, an optimal coupling P um, which minimizes the total cost of displacement so let me give you some intuitions about this, this equation so P should belong to a set of coupling and uh, those those coupling they uh, state that actually um, uh, we need to move all the mass from uh, the bakeries to all the mass from the from the cafe. Uh, and I will discuss a little bit more about uh, about this geometric uh, object uh, uh, later. But uh, clearly, you can see this in the discrete case as a kind of uh, matrix, uh, which is. Uh, uh, actually a joint law, a probability joint law. So it's a, a matrix of positive value that sum to one with uh, prescribed marginals that are both A and, uh, and B. So um, if we look at the element IG of this matrix, then it's how much, uh, how, how many breads are, are, are translated from a bakery uh, I to a given cafe uh, G. And uh, with uh, this notation, the product of the cost from moving from I to G multiplied by the, the amount of mass which is shifted in by, by P is the is this total cost. And this is why we have a, a total cost because we are summing over all the bakeries and all the cafes this, uh, the, uh, this cost. So in, in this case, the, 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 the problem so this is the formal definition of the P, A, uh, B um, set. So it's a set of uh, positive matrices of size, number of bakeries times number of cafe, and with the prescribed uh, marginals, A, I, and B, uh, B, uh, B, G. So P, it can be understood actually as a kind of uh, bipartite graph between mu and, uh, and, uh, and mu. And uh, for all the locations in mu, for all the, the, the bakeries, we can uh, associate through this matrix P, 
uh, a set of uh, cafes that will receive a given amount of, uh, of bread produced by the, by, by, by the bakery. So actually, this um, discrete formulation, it has a, a continuous counterpart, which is given by this uh, formulation, where we just replace the, the double sum by uh, a double uh, integral. And, uh, and P then is just uh, a continuous uh, joint probability uh, di di distribution. So those are exactly the same, uh, the, the, the same formulation. And this is the original uh, uh, Kantorovich formulation of the optimal transport uh, problem. Um, so now you, you might have uh, heard about optimal transport through the word uh, Wasserstein distance. So it's mostly the same, the same thing as this formulation. The only subtleties are, are that um, we are considering for a cost a distance function, D. So it's, it's a little less generic than the, the general cost function that can be uh, uh, what, whatever cost we, we, we want to design. And uh, we are not looking exactly as uh, for the solution. Um, we are not looking at the best optimal uh, coupling. I mean, we are, we are trying to, to just um, quantify the, um, the value of this uh, total cost. So the Wasserstein distance is basically the minimal value that we need to have to uh, displace the probability mu toward the probability uh, mu. And the nice thing is that uh, this Wasserstein distance, it's uh, actually defining a, a metric in the uh, uh, probability uh, measure uh, space. And more specifically, we know that uh, if uh, the Wasserstein distance is new, then uh, mu uh, equal uh, new almost uh, almost everywhere. And uh, this um, notion of distance between probability di distribution, it's interesting because it embeds this geometric notion of the space through the cost function D or, uh, or C, as I called it uh, before. So it's really related to uh, the notion of, okay, if we take this route, it might, um, it might be more costly. And this way of embedding the geometry of the space, it's, it's quite unique and, uh, and proper to the optimal transport uh, distances. But, okay, uh, if we uh, put apart this small introduction, we are now in the case where Mm, we consider two probability distributions, but that live into two very uh, different uh, spaces. I mean, uh, in these cases, uh, if, uh, for instance, I have data in R2 and data in uh, R3, I cannot find a cost function that will take one sample in R2 and one sample in R3 and compute a distance. So in this case, we do not have access to a specific, I mean, to a generic cost function. There is no notion of geometry anymore between the two uh, probability di 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 distributions. Uh, so th this is the case, I mean, I, I was talking about R2 and R3. So this is, for example, the case when you have data that are uh, images that do not have, do not share the same, uh, the, the same dimensions, for instance. But it's all, also the case uh, when you are dealing with, uh, with, with graphs. When you are dealing with graphs, then, uh, you do not have a simple way to measure the distance between two uh, vertex, uh, two vertices of the, of, of the graph. There is no such notion of distance. So how can we cope with this uh, problem? So um, this problem was, uh, I mean, there is a way to, to solve it through uh, the so-called Groma Wasserstein distance that was uh, introduced by Facundo Memoli in 2011, and also um, studied more theoretically by uh, Peter Sturm uh, some years later. And uh, in this case, we are not considering a, a specific distance between the, the element samples of the probability distribution, but we are rather considering the intra-domain cost. It means that we are going to look at uh, the distances uh, inside each respective domain. And we are going to, uh, to um, design the coupling in such a way that um, samples uh, that are, um, are, should be linked through the coupling matrix should have the same 
distance relations with their neighborhood. So this is why this problem is actually a, a, a quadratic pro, uh, programming problem with respect to, uh, to, to P. So let me give you maybe uh, some um, intuitions about this. So now we are considering a distance between distances. So we are taking the distance, all the distances inside X and all the distances inside uh, Y. And we are measuring how much we can make them match through the coupling, uh, through the coupling uh, P. So th the problem is, is it's a little bit more complicated to solve. And in, in this talk, I will definitely not talk about uh, the, the solvers for, for this and how, how we can program those, uh, those, those distances, but, but still it can be um, computed uh, with classical uh, algorithm from the, from, from up the shelf. And um, you just need to uh, understand how is, I mean, how we replace this geometric notion of distance by just associating points that share the common uh, specific uh, relations with their neighborhood inside their own uh, domains, inside their own, uh, their own space, spaces. Right. So, um, uh, yes. So now this Gromov assertion distance, it, it, it's interesting to see it maybe as uh, a notion of uh, distance that will be null in the case where uh, the um, two probability uh, uh, distributions are the same with respect to all the possible uh, iso isomorphism. So, so it's uh, invariant to all the possible uh, permutations of node, rotations of node, or translation of the object in their respective space, because their uh, distance in their respective spaces they are uh, naturally invariant to those uh, to those elements. And um, so what, what, we, what we can say more, more formally is that, okay, if X is called a metric space, so an MM space, uh, it means that uh, the distance between the two distribution mu and u would be null if and only if the, there exists a transformation from X to Y, uh, which is uh, preserving the distances uh, through the, the, the operation. So it's, in, uh, uh, it's clearly uh, equivariant with respect to the set of uh, isometries. Okay, um, I, I will skip those details. And then just a little word about uh, those gromov wasserstein distance. So as I was telling, it was introduced uh, mostly in, uh, in two, um, I mean, yeah, first paper was in 2008. And then the first applications of this was uh, mostly related to shape matching. In the shape matching problem, you have two geometric, usually in 3D geometric shapes. And then you want, they are not exactly the same. You do not have a priori uh, correspondences between the shapes. And then you want to find some, um, uh, some way to, uh, to go from one shape to uh, an, uh, another, another shape. So it was mostly used for shape comparison. And uh, because it has this, those properties of, of being invariant to, uh, to, uh, to isometry. And then from uh, maybe, maybe the, yeah, from maybe 2019, they are started to have some applications of our uh, graphs and also in the case of generative modeling between spaces that are a priori incomparable. And in, in the context of biology, there was recently some, some nice work uh, that uh, used also this, this um, chromova wasserstein notion of, uh, of distance. Okay, so th this was the introduction part. And then I will talk about uh, how we can use this chromova wasserstein distance to to measure similarities between, uh, be, between graphs. So first of all, I will start by um, making a short um, introduction to how can we see graphs that are objects composed of uh, maybe uh, vertices, edges, uh, features over the, the vertices. How can we see them as 
probability distribution. Well, um, in, in this specific work, we are also adding this notion of uh, uh, features that are uh, related to vertices. So a graph basically should not have features, but usually people discuss about labeled graph, meaning that associated to each vertex of the uh, each vertex of the graph, there should be a label or maybe a, it can be multivariate, also a vector of feature associated with each uh, the, the vertex. So in this case, we have both a combination of uh, a feature information per vertex of the graph and the structural information, which is uh, supported by the ages and all the, those uh, relations uh, within, uh, within, the, within the graph. So in this case, how do we model this as probability distribution? So features, they are re represented as those color uh, dots here. And uh, features may belong to a space omega in my notations. And it can be a, a vector valued space. It can be a scalar space or whatever space you, uh, that you, you, you want it to be. Then the structure is actually encoded with respect to this metric space associated to the, to the graph. And this metric space, it's just, uh, I mean, the specific notion of distances between two uh, uh, vertex of the, uh, of the graph. And then, because we are dealing with probability distribution, we also have some weights, uh, some uh, uh, measure of probability mass per vertex of the graph. And those weights, again, we can, we can see those, those, those things as simply as a uniform distribution, meaning that all the, the vertex, all, all the vertices of the graph would share the same weight. But we can also have some uh, weights that are bigger on some, uh, ver uh, some vertices and uh, smaller on other vertices. We just have the constraint that this HI is sum to one because it's related to a probability distribution. So with all uh, those information, we have the, 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 the following thing. I mean, we can express a probability distribution associated to a labeled graph uh, as a mu. Mu, it's a collection of weighted Dirac's and those Dirac's, they both have, uh, um, uh, they both have a feature information and they both have also uh, uh, an information in a metric space related to the entire, uh, entire graph. Right. And now he, he, uh, I will show you how we can define a, a meaningful measure of distance. So it's, I mean, in this case, uh, um, we are dealing with objects that uh, to, uh, maybe uh, at the um, contrary to what I presented just before with Gromov Wasserstein, we have those notions of features uh, onto, the, onto, the, um, onto the vertices. So how can we uh, merge this potential distance between the features and potential distance between the, the, um, the metric nature of the of those graphs. So we proposed something that is called the fused gromov wasserstein distance. And uh, if you followed so far, you can see that it's it's closely uh, linked to the to the um, to the to the gromov wasserstein uh, formulation of the problem. But now we have two uh, components in the in the cost. We have a distance which is related to a distance between the features of uh, supported by the, the, the vertices of the graph. And we have also one component, which are the distance now between the intra, I mean, in the, in all the, um, the, 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 the graph. That means that we, we need now to compare uh, notions of distances between vertices inside each, uh, in each graph. So we have just a, um, a, weight, a weighted relations between those, those, two, uh, those two terms. This weight relation, it's supported by the alpha, uh, alpha value. And this alpha, as you can see, it performs a kind of uh, linear interpolation between uh, uh, the importance that we put onto the distance between the features and the importance that we put uh, uh, that so that the the structure of the two graphs should be the same. So what, what, what we have shown is that uh, 
So you can see that if we put, we set alpha to zero, then we recover exactly the Wasserstein distance. And if we set alpha to one, then we recover simply the Gromov Wasserstein distance. So this fused Gromov Wasserstein distance, it's a kind of generalization where you interpolate between the two, uh, the, 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 the two distances. And uh, once you solve this problem, uh, then you, uh, you recover an assignment matrix, the P matrix that I discussed before. And this P matrix, it's basically linking uh, all uh, the vertices of the two graphs together in a, in a meaningful, uh, meaningful fashion. So let me give you an example to uh, fully understand the, 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 this thing. So now I have, I mean, my graphs are two trees and uh, those trees, they, are, they have leaf nodes and those leaf nodes, they are colored uh, uh, elements. So you can see that the structure of the two uh, trees, they are basic, basically the same, but there's still a, a small difference in the fact that uh, in the end, we have either a couple of red uh, and blue samples, or in the second tree, we have like blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, and blue, red. So the structure of the trees are the same, but, uh, and, um, we want to find a distance that we'll be able to discriminate. I mean, to say that, okay, those two trees are not exactly the, are not exactly the same. So first of all, what do we choose uh, as a, a metric inside those two, uh, two graphs? So we can just simply choose as for the describing this structure, we can simply choose to use the shortest path between the leaves. So if I take the first two one, they are at a distance two because I need to make two hopes to, uh, to reach the, the first two uh, red uh, point. But if I take, I mean, in the green, uh, in green side of the graph, if I take a red point and a blue, um, uh, blue, blue one, then they are at the distance four because I need to make, to make four hopes to, uh, to, uh, to, to reach them. So this is the kind of, of metric, but there is quite an, uh, a big number of ways to, um, uh, to, to define the, this notion of distance in, inside the, the, the graph. But this is the one that we are using in this, uh, in this example. And now, okay, if we just take the Wasserstein distance between those blue and red uh, samples, we can see that the Wasserstein distance is, is, is null because it would associate all the blue points together and all the red points together. And because there is the same number of red and blue points, then the Wasserstein distance would be new. Now, if we want to, uh, um, to compute the Gromov Wasserstein distance, because the structure of the trees are, are just the same, then the distance will be null as well. But if we take the fused Gromov Wasserstein, uh, then we can show that it will be always positive because, I mean, you, you, you need to make a trade off between associating the same. Uh, elements at the same position in the structure. And uh, also you need to associate uh, elements that share the, the same property being blue or being, uh, being red. But in this case, I mean, for all the values of alpha excluded zero and one, then the, the fused Gromov Wasserstein would, uh, uh, would be positive. And uh, so we, we, we tested this because we have a, a meaningful notion of distances between graphs we can just use it as a, a way to perform classification. And uh, I mean, we, one of the nice thing, and I will not comment much more the, this slide, but one of the nice thing and takeaway is that, I mean, this notion of distance, it's uh, usually better than the classical Weisfeller Lehman notion of distance between, uh, between graph, which is very classical for defining kernels between, uh, between graph. And uh, at, at the time where we, we made this study, we showed also that it was uh, competitive with a uh, graph neural network uh, and uh, sometimes even better. And it's quite interesting because, I mean, we do not have any uh, learning of a complex uh, neural network over the data. We just plug the distance into some uh, SVM or uh, whatever uh, distance-based uh, cl classifier and, and it works. So it's, it's quite remarkable that we, we could reach um, those performances of, uh, of, of graph neural network because they generally do um, a very specific learning over the, over the data. They can usually be trained end to end 
And in our case, there is no such training. So, uh, so we were quite pleased with those, uh, those results. And I will show you also uh, an interesting thing. It's that because we have a notion of distance, we can play with it and make sense of uh, problems that are and that were class, I mean, very difficult to handle is the notion of computing a mean between graphs, for instance. So um, usually when you want to, I mean, when you are in a classical Euclidean space, you can easily compute a mean as a solution of a minimization problem. So this is basically a notion of, of Barry Center in, uh, in the, the space uh, RD uh, when you, you are using the Euclidean, uh, Euclidean norm. But we can also use a similar uh, way of defining the, the, the a mean or a barycenter when we have access to a, a metric space. So you simply look for the point which is minimizing the sum of weighted distances to uh, all the, um, the, the, the support uh, sample, like x1, x2, and, uh, and, and x3. And uh, because now we have a, a notion of distance between graphs that, that should not share the same number of nodes or, or the, the, the same weight or whatever, we can define, I mean, if we are able to solve this optimization problem, then we can define such thing as a, 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 as a mean of a, a population of, uh, of graphs. So we simply define this notion of fused gomova sorstein barry centers as the solution of finding a uh, new, so finding a, a graph, which is minimizing the sum of all the fused gromov Wasserstein distances to all the graphs in our, uh, in our set. And um, so this is interesting because, I mean, when you look at new, you can choose it. I mean, let me give you some example. You can choose uh, actually the number of samples that you want and the number of vertices that you want to have in your mean. And you can choose also to, uh, um, to uh, optimize over also the weights uh, of, the, um, of the, the, the vertices of the graph. But I will discuss this uh, later. So yeah, one uh, quick uh, visual example is in this case, I mean, we, we, we created a population of, uh, of graph by taking a, a ring shaped graph. And then we add uh, randomly some samples. We add randomly some uh, some vertices, so we generate a population of, uh, of graph, and then we, comp we compute the mean. And uh, in the first line, in the first row, yeah, the mean is uh, composed by, uh, I think, something like 16 uh, uh, vertices. And in the second row, we compute the mean, but we fix the number of uh, vertices uh, to be uh, equal to seven. And we recover this kind of ring shape from all the, uh, uh, all the this population of uh, of graph that we that we generated. So being able to compute means of graph, it's something that we we, we found to be very uh, very interesting. And maybe also trying to play with this notion, we can also try to do some graph coarsening with this approach. So how can we do this? We simply try to solve a minimization problem. We want to find. I mean, when you have one specific graph, you want to find another graph, which is the closest in the sense of the fuse gromov wasserstein distance, but with a, a much, uh, much less uh, number of, uh, of atoms. So in this case, for instance, we have a, um, a graph with four communities, and then we just uh, set uh, to four the number of uh, some of vertices uh, vertices in our final graph, and we want to find just the, um, the connections between those these, these four vertices graph and our initial graph. And what is interesting in this case, um, okay, so first it is just mostly exactly the same as the Barry Center problem, but with just one sample uh, in, uh, in our um, one, uh, one element in our bar, 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 bar center. And what the second thing which is interesting is that if you look at the coupling between the elements of the Corson graph and the, all the, the vertices of the initial graph, then you have also this connection between 
the, um, the non, and this is represented on the uh, right part of the figure, you have the connection between the, uh, all the nodes in the um, Corson uh, uh, version and in the original uh, initial uh, version. Okay, um, and I will, I will skip the, this thing, but yes, you can, you can make clustering also when you have the, this notion of, of distance, but I, I will skip the, 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 this part. So um, as a takeaway for this part, yes, the nice thing is that we can define a notion of distance between graph that have uh, features and attributes and that not necessarily do need to share the same number of, uh, of nodes, the same number of vertices, what you call the order of the graph. And uh, from this, I mean, distances, we have shown that, uh, I mean, there are meaningful distances and they can be used uh, in several learning, uh, learning tasks. Okay, and now I will go to uh, a continuation of this work where we consider Uh, this type of distance, Bromov uh, Wasserstein type of distance, to do uh, something which is very classical in the signal processing literature and data analysis. It's called dictionary uh, dictionary learning. This work was uh, presented at uh, last year uh, ICML, and uh, I know that in um, maybe in a, in a time where everyone is doing uh, deep learning and everyone has maybe. Uh, Uh, forgotten how to um, uh, all the, the 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 gold the 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 good old uh, recipes. I, I will discuss a little bit about uh, what is the dictionary learning and what's the traditional way of doing dictionary learning. So I assume that most of you have uh, have seen uh, have seen this maybe during uh, their uh, their formations. And uh, but okay, let, let me discuss a little bit what is the classical dictionary learning. So dictionary learning, it's a way of decomposing one specific signal uh, X into a basis, uh, specific basis, which is given by some uh, elements, D1, D2, et cetera, D, uh, DD. And uh, all those uh, elements from this basis are forming a dictionary uh, capital, uh, capital D. So uh, in this case, you are just saying that X is a combination of all the elements, a linear combination of all the elements uh, from the dictionary. And generally what is interesting is the overcomplete case where uh, M, the dimension of the space, is uh, much uh, less than uh, D, which is the number of elements that you have in your uh, dictionary. So once you have set a dictionary capital D, then Uh, I mean, you need to find W1, uh, W2, et cetera, WD. That is the unmixing part. It means that, okay, I am a little bit of the first element of my dictionary plus uh, uh, another, uh, um, another bit of this uh, other element of my dictionary, et cetera. So uh, W is the decomposition of X over the elements of the dictionary. Yet. So this is the classical way of, um, of finding this, uh, this, this dictionary. And uh, well, in, in the first line, I, I discussed this decomposition over for uh, one sample X, but usually you have many uh, points, many samples in your data set, and then you, you will keep fixed the dictionary and try to find a decomposition W Uh, to, to the power uh, k, which is basically the decomposition for the kf element of your, uh, of your, of your data set. So there are many, many uh, variants of this, uh, of this problem. Uh, it's also called a representation learning problem because uh, linear representation learning, because you are just expressing the data sample x into another basis. And uh, it's called a lot for, it's, it's used a lot for uh, dimensionality reduction, recommender systems, etc. And it comes in very uh, different flavor. For instance, you can uh, impose to have uh, orthogonality over the elements of the dictionary. And uh, you can impose over uh, types of constraints, like you want 
uh, hold W to be uh, positive. So in this case, you are in a, a cone uh, spanned by the elements of the dictionary. Or for instance, you want the W to be positive and sum to one with a simplex constraint. And in this case, you are in the convex hull of all the uh, dictionary elements uh, D1 until, uh, until DD. You want to be a convex combination of the elements of the dictionary. So there are a lot of uh, works on this, a lot of ways to do, uh, to do this. And um, if you look at the optimization, the related optimization problem, then you have something like, okay, I want to find for all my samples K uh, inside my data set of capital K elements, I want to find their decomposition W uh, uh, superscript k and the dictionary the, uh, the best associated dictionary uh, d and uh, basically the um, the this formulation i mean is basically yes the sum over the the w i d i is the representation of xk inside the the, the dictionary uh, basis and you want I mean, to be to, to have this representation as close as possible as all the data samples. So it's just a fidelity term, fidelity term with respect to the data set. And um, well, you want to find both dictionaries and uh, the W. And usually people, they, they use uh, a regularization term also, which would impose some sparsity constraint, uh, especially in the overcomplete case, sparsity constraints over the the decomposition in the, in, the, in, in, in the dictionary. So again, let, let, let me be clear that this way of seeing things, it's basically the, uh, the classical dictionary learning setting or sparse coding uh, that you, you, you might find in the literature uh, maybe uh, 10, years, uh, 10, 10 years before now. And how do people solve this problem? They usually rely on a, a principle, optimization principle, which is in alternate optimization. Uh, at first, you fix the W, um, the w weights, and then you update all the elements of the dictionary. You update D, and then you fix the uh, dictionary D, and then you update all the elements W. So it can be shown that this alternate optimization is actually uh, uh, converging to some stationary points that are not, uh, not that bad. And there are a lot of variants, uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, if you know uh, orthogonal matching pursuit, for instance, it's a specific way of doing uh, this, uh, this type of solving this type of problem. Uh, you have also the famous um, work from Meral, which is called the online uh, dictionary learning, which is also an online version of this uh, optimization problem. Okay, there's a lot of uh, works related to, uh, related to this. So now, is it possible to have the same kind of dictionary learning approach, but with graphs? So recall that in our setting, graphs, they are uh, composed by features, a structure, and some, uh, some, some weight. So now, but it's just for the sake of this uh, talk, because it's clearly possible to use the feature information, but I will consider that my graph is just the notion of structure. We do not have uh, a notion of features between the, the vertices. So a graph will now simply be uh, uh, expressed as a combination of uh, capital C, which is a pairwise relation matrix between all the vertices of the graph, and H, which are the, the weights of my, uh, of my, uh, of my graph. And, and basically, the, the, the big picture related to dictionary learning over graph is that, okay, we have a, gra a graph data set, and then we want to find some atoms, some elements in my dictionary that are small graphs or maybe larger graphs. I mean, you can set the, the size of those, of, of, those graphs, of those graphs as you want. And uh, we will try to uh, find those uh, minimal um, atom uh, graphs. And at the same time, we will try to find a, um, a, a final decomposition of all my graphs in my data set that, are, that can be expressed simply as 
weighted linear combination of those basic uh, atom of those basics, uh, ba ba basic scraps. So as you can see, maybe on, on these plots, the W here, they, they belong to a kind of, uh, of simplex because we have this constraint of the summing to one. And I mean, if we compose the different, I mean, if we sum the different uh, cost matrix from our atoms, then we want to guarantee that with respect to the gromov wasserstein distance, it will be very close, as isometrically close possible to the, uh, the big uh, cost uh, matrix from my initial graph in my uh, initial data set. And if I, 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 um, I, I want to be a little bit more precise about this, then each of my graphs, I mean, if you have a dictionary fixed, a uh, fixed dictionary, then each, each of my graph in my data set, it can be represented by this vector of W value. So we are learning a novel representation of my graph as simply a decomposition over uh, a specific dictionary of, uh, of smaller, uh, smaller graphs. So how can we, uh, I mean, do this, uh, this, this magic? So, I mean, if you know about dictionary learning, you will not be surprised by this formulation. We are simply looking uh, for the unmixing part to the, the vector W belonging to the simplex, which yield the minimum Gromov-Wasserstein distance uh, to the current graph that I'm handling. And you can see here that um, we have this uh, term here, the min minus lambda with a squared L2 norm of the W. And this term is actually uh, uh, promoting when once uh, W is on the simplex, this uh, term is actually promoting uh, sparsity inside my W uh, vector. So in this case, oh, how, how can we interpret this? We want uh, my graph to be the, the best expressed with respect to the JW distance as a weighted combination of the adjacency matrix matrices of the uh, of the, of the graphs from the dictionary. Um, so how can we solve this? So it's it's quite easy to uh, to solve actually. But I, I, okay, I will I will, I will skip uh, skip skip this part. And um, I will skip this one also too. Sorry. So the step one is doing the unmixing part, and now. How can we solve um, for the uh, for all the for all the graphs in my data set? Then we can simply uh, solve all the unmixing problems with all the graphs from uh, from my data set. And once we have all those W values, then we can update simply update the. Uh, the, matri the matrices CI of the graph from the uh, dictionary. And all this can be done with an alternate minimization uh, problem, that meaning that we first do a lot of unmixing problem for all the graphs in my data set, and then we update, simply update all the uh, adjacency matrices from my uh, final, uh, final graph. And okay, last subtlety, but I, I, I will stop soon because I, I've been already much, much too long that I should. But um, one subtlety is that we can also learn not only for uh, the adjacency matrices from, for the dictionary, but we can also learn for some uh, weights in my dictionary. And uh, those weights, they can simply also be expressed as co linear combination of weights of graphs in my uh, in my dictionary. Okay, let me let me finish maybe because I feel that I, I'm not very clear and I should take more time. Let, let me finish by this uh, this uh, simple example. 
where I mean this is a toy example, but uh, I, I would refer to the to the to the work from the from the paper if you want to have more uh, I mean quantitative results. So um, we generated a lot of uh, data set with a lot of uh, graph that follow the stochastic block model uh, um, way of defining a model for defining a, a graph. So uh, the stochastic block model, if you don't know it, it's a way to uh, parameterize a number of communities uh, in, in a graph and the probability of two elements from two different communities to be linked together. So it's a probabilistic model of graph. So if we say that we have uh, a set of SBM with one, two, and three communities, it means that, I mean, you can look at the example, you have a lot of graphs where you have just all the elements are connected together, and you have also some graph where you have two communities that are really linked together, but few link between the communities, and the same thing apply with uh, um, a graph with only uh, three communities. And um, well, if we plot as uh, colored dots, I mean, uh, orange is uh, SBM of class two, uh, blue is SBM of class one, and green is SBM of class three. If we plot the corresponding W values uh, onto, the, onto a, a, a simplex of dimension, uh, of dimension two, we see that we uh, successfully uh, separated uh, the different class of graph, and we separated it um, nicely because the colors are not mixed uh, to, to, together. And the second graph is actually the same thing, but when you when you have uh, when you add the sparsity constraints into the value, so the more sparsity you have, the closer you will get to uh, vertices of the simplex. And again, we see that we successfully, I mean, uh, uh, provided a representation of the graph uh, that are uh, really separating well the different uh, SBM uh, communities. Okay, I, I, I will stop here. I, I, I talked already too long, but, um, and uh, I, I made uh, a lot less than I expected to, but uh, I, um, I feel that I would need more, more time to. Uh, to speak uh, correctly and uh, um, about the, the rest. So I, I, I will stop here. Thanks for your attention and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, regarding this uh, presentation. Thanks. Uh, a very, very, very impressive work, actually. Thank you. So uh, we'll move now to uh, questions in the audience. 